very You thought you could escape. Um, all right, so she said that since I'm already mic'd up, I'm going to have to introduce myself. Um, so I'm Barack Obama. Um, I'm Jonathan Eisen. I'm a professor at UC Davis um, with appointments in many different places at UC Davis, uh, in the Department of Evolution and Ecology, and in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology, and in the Genome Center. And if you merge all of those sort of terms together, what I study is the evolution of microbial genomes. Um, but I'm not going to talk per se about that. Um, I will include a little bit about that. But I thought what I would do um, is give you a little historical perspective, how I got interested in what I'm doing, and then a little bit about what the latest, latest fun research is going on in studies of microorganisms. And actually, um, if there are any questions along the way, just like throw things at me or yell out. I'm happy to stop. Um, I'm hoping that my iPhone, which I seem to have connected to my computer, actually works so I can walk around. Um, oh, it works. Cool. So, um, so what I what I am in a way going to talk about is some of my obsessions, and I have a lot of these, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, I have, for example, one big obsession that I will not talk about, which is what you could call open science. There's been a large movement um, in the last five to ten years in particular to increase the access to scientific information, scientific technologies, and scientific resources to make those resources both more freely available in terms of being cheap or at no cost, or make those resources be openly available, which means that you can not only get access to them, but you can reuse them in any particular way. And there's been a particular part of this movement called open access, which is making the scientific literature freely and openly available. And there's an organization called the Public Library of Science, which I've been heavily involved in, um, PLOF, which is part of this movement for making the scientific literature freely and openly available. And if anybody has any interest in this, I'm happy to talk to them about it afterwards, or I can give out my email address to uh, people here, and I, I'd love to talk about it, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, I have another obsession, which I'm also not going to talk about today, which is the use of social media in science. Um, social media has, of course, taken off as I assume all of the students here are well aware of. Um, unfortunately, many of the crotchety old folks in the academia are not completely aware of this. Um, and there are many ways that social media um, can be used really well for academic research and as part of the academic enterprise, whether it's communicating science or interacting with the public or um, building communities just like communities happen on Facebook or on Twitter or in other locations. And I've spent the last five or more years experimenting with whatever new social media tool comes out to see if it's useful for scientific enterprise. Some of them are not, uh, but many of them are. And again, if you're interested, I have a blog. I'm very active on Twitter. Um, I you know, probably spend a little too much time on some of these things. But, um, what I am going to talk about is another obsession of mine, which actually I didn't really realize was an obsession of mine completely until I went home to my mom's house in the Bethesda, Maryland, a few years ago. And as many of you students here will experience, either now or in you know 10 years, your parents are going to want you to take all your stuff. Um, and uh, my mom collected together a few boxes from the basement with all my stuff that I had to take home with me. And I went through this stuff, and I found this, ignore the fact that that is, in fact, my handwriting from high school. I, I don't know. It certainly doesn't look like that now. In ninth grade in high school, I had an assignment where I was allowed to write my own essay question about anything. And I wrote an essay question about evolution of bacteria. I mean, first of all, what a dork. <laughs> um, I could have written about anything. And I, I don't remember this at all. I don't remember being interested in bacteria back then. I mean, my parents were scientists, but they never talked about their work. 
I went to college to study East Asian studies. I switched midway through college into biology, but I don't, I don't remember any of this, but I, you can read it on my blog, I have a whole essay about the evolution of bacteria from ninth grade. It's actually not that bad. Um, and that's what I have been interested in basically since I was an undergraduate in college. Uh, studies of bacteria and microorganisms, their evolution, and various other aspects of their diversity. And um, Neil knows this, but uh, many of you probably don't. I have yet another obsession that I'm going to try and tell you about and sort of integrate with my microbiology obsession, which is the reason I got interested in biology, even back then in ninth grade, I was in fact interested in biology, um, was that I was a birder as a kid. And I uh, had a field guide that I carried with me just about everywhere. We went on a lot of family camping trips. And I brought my binoculars with me, and I brought the bird field guide with me. And I was really into natural history, in particular birds. I'm not sure exactly why it was birds as opposed to mushrooms or trees or flowers, but for me it was birds. And I want to tell you this story. This is a true story, actually, um, about a scene like this, where um, in this environment, someone uh, was looking out in their yard and they saw this bird. I don't know if you can see that bird, but anybody here know what that is? Right, it's a robin. It's, in fact, an American robin. If you have a bird book like I do, I have about 65 of these bird books um, of different sorts. I collect field guides. Um, you can get out your bird book if you didn't know it was a robin. You could look around in the bird book and eventually figure out, uh, you can't see that that well, but you could identify it based upon the field guide as a robin. You could read about what a robin is supposed to be like and what it's supposed to do. If you're a bigger dork, you can get a bird field guide on your iPhone, which I have, and you can look up the robin and learn all sorts of information about it. And that's you know, basically what people did when they saw the robin in their yard. And so the interesting thing about this story is if you zoom out from this house, you are in a place where an American robin is not supposed to be. So this is in uh, the United Kingdom, and when people looked out in their yard and they saw an American robin, um, they you know, got out their bird book, the field guide for the British birds, and there was no bird like that in their bird book. And some of them, you know, knew what it was, and there was this thing called the internet, so, you know, they could look up other types of birds, but they didn't have the field guide, and they rapidly identified this as an, an American robin, very, very out of place in England. And um, this only works, they could only do this because people have made field guides for the birds. We know how to identify different birds, we know where the birds are supposed to be, we have tools for helping guide people towards that identification. And they knew immediately that this bird was out of place. And if any of you are birders, um, you would know that birders, like me, are a bit obsessed with their you know, birding enterprise. They share lots of information. There are news groups and chat groups and now Facebook groups and all sorts of other means for people to share the latest and greatest birds that they see. If you, you know, see an unusual bird in the Yolo Basin right near here. Um, someone else has probably already posted about it, and there's lots of discussion of this. And so people were really excited. They posted about this weird American robin. Lots of people came to see the American robin that was out of place because the birders were very excited about seeing this. Now, as an aside, a raptor rapidly came in and ate the American robin. That's not the point of my story. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is actually a BBC News article about the raptor coming in and eating the poor American robin that was out of place. Um, but the reason I want to tell you this story, and unfortunately it's after dinner, right? So, um, is this, this concept of a field guide is fundamental to understanding the diversity of life around us. It gives us these tools to take the information that's been collected over hundreds, if not thousands of years about the means to identify organisms, to classify them, to find them, and to you know, understand their biogeography and their distribution patterns, and integrate that to understand if something is out of place or not out of place. My obsession for about 20 years has been to try and figure out whether or not we can do this for microbes. Can we make a field guide equivalent to the field guide to birds for microorganisms? And what um, 
Before talking about sort of the progress towards doing a field guide to microbes, I want to talk a little bit about what microbes are, in case you know some of you may not know. I know many of the projects of the students here were in fact about microbes, and I know, I mean everybody's thought about this a little bit, but I just thought I'd give you a tiny little um, introduction. So microbes have been known by their processes for thousands of years, right? People have been making fermented beverages or bread or doing other things associated with microbes for thousands of years, but they have only been seen for a few hundred years. The invention of the microscope was what allowed people to actually see microorganisms and look in different environments. Uh, that's Van Leeuwenhoek, who was the first person to look at um, microorganisms and to start to draw them and characterize them. And you know, microbes are defined as organisms that you can't see without the aid of uh, microscopes. You can't see them with your, your naked eye. And if you look with a microscope in just about any environment on the planet, you see little cells squiggling around doing something in those environments. And this is really interesting. Van Leeuwenhoek, up until now, people see all sorts of interesting things in many environments that they look at. And I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail on this, but one of the challenges with taking that approach and converting it into my dream of a field guide is that the appearance, the physical appearance of a microbe in a microscope is not enough information to tell us what that organism is or what its biological potential is. So I can carry around binoculars and learn an enormous amount about the birds in Davis or in Northern California or in any other environment by just watching them, by looking at them, by identifying certain features that they have, comparing to the field guide, even if they're not identified in the field guide, I can still learn a lot about those birds by their visual appearance. And one of the reasons for this is that appearance of plants and animals, in particular, does not change that rapidly over evolutionary time, such that very closely related birds tend to look similar to each other, on average, and very distantly related animals tend to look different from each other. And so their appearance can actually be a useful guide towards who they are. Now it's not perfect. There are things called convergent evolution where distantly related organisms become similar to each other, and you have very rapid evolution in some lineages where close relatives can look different. But in general, this works for plants and animals. For microbes, it doesn't, for two main reasons. First of all, there aren't a lot of features to look at for most microbes in a microscope. You can see their shape their size, some of their features, but not a lot of detail that you would get compared to, say, the bone structure of a horse. Um, and in addition, their appearance changes really rapidly over evolutionary time. And so this has been a conundrum for people like me who want to understand the diversity of microorganisms if we go and use the best tool that we have available, which is basically a microscope, to look at them, we can't tell what they are. And so this has been part of microbiology for many years um, and has been a challenge. And I'll you know, come back to what this uh, challenge means in a minute, but I just thought I'd show you if you aren't familiar with a lot of the diversity of microorganisms. It's not that there isn't interesting stuff going on in the microbial world. There, in fact, is an incredible diversity of form, that is the appearance of different microorganisms. You have um, incredible diversity of shape, incredible diversity of sort of style and color, and um, sort of observable behavior that you might see, but it's generally not anywhere near enough information to do what you would do with birds. Um, there's incredible diversity of function, too, so it's not just that there's different forms, but you can see, right, we're most familiar with the microbes that do nasty things to us, like this is a drawing, I think, from a cholera epidemic, um, but the pathogens, the bacteria and viruses, and other uh, microbes that make us sick, we actually know a lot about. Um, there are a lot of good microbes out there, good being that they do some function that we humans like, like the microbes that are associated with legumes that help the legumes pull nitrogen from the air, fix it, and turn it into usable nitrogen for the plants. There's an incredible diversity of so-called beneficial microbes in various plants and animals and other ecosystems. Um, one of the groups of microorganisms or types of microorganisms that I've spent a lot of time studying are what are called extremophiles. These are microorganisms that live in an environment that could be, could be considered
consider sort of the end of the spectrum of conditions where organisms are able to live. And so if you look at any particular environmental condition like temperature, or salt, or um, pressure, or pH, a variety of environmental conditions, and you look at the extreme edges of that condition, the organisms that tend to survive in those extreme edges are usually microbes. And they can live in conditions like 110 degrees Celsius. There are microorganisms that prefer to grow at 110 degrees Celsius, and are in fact killed when you lower the temperature for them. And there are microorganisms that grow at zero pH. There are microorganisms that can survive and thrive in these conditions that most you know, plants and animals would have a hard time dealing with. It. There are, of course, the microbes that make things that we like, um, the consumable microbes. There's lots of historical interaction between humans and microbes in making beer and yeast. Um, making beer and bread via yeast and making cheeses and making fermented products of all sorts of different kinds. Um, there's a big movement to understand microbes now because a lot of people are trying to use them for biofuel production. Um, and you know, the reason many of us study microbes is microbes play important roles in all of the global nutrient cycles on the planet. And they play critical roles in basically every ecosystem out there. And so with that sort of background perspective, what I want to do for the last little bit here is talk about what I consider to be progress towards getting this field guide to the microbe. And most of the progress towards getting there has happened in the last few years, largely through the use of what we could call, what I call CSI microbiology, which is basically using characterization of the DNA of microorganisms to indirectly learn a lot about either who they are or what their potential is out in the environment. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how this works, sort of building up to the field guide angle. So one aspect of doing this for microbes that's been really important is to understand where they sit in an evolutionary perspective compared to other organisms on the planet. And that has been very challenging historically, and I'll show you a little bit about why, but just you know, right, so you take a human family tree, you can connect people to each other in some sort of history. If you go a step further back, we can do a primate or, you know, ancient human and human relatives family tree and connect them to each other. We can zoom out even further and connect all of the mammals to each other and build a history of all of the animals, their ancestors, and their descendants. And that's sort of the tree of mammals. And if we zoom all the way out, to include all of the organisms throughout history on the planet. That's what's called the tree of life, the evolutionary relationships among everything throughout the history of the planet. And since the time of Darwin, many scientists have tried to sketch out a model for what they consider to be the tree of life. And one of the first attempts to do this was someone named Ernst Haeckel, and he drew out a tree um, that had three or maybe four, depending on how you do this, main branches. You had plants over on the left, animals over on the right, and then in the middle is a group that he called protista, which is basically all the, the small organisms that people might see in a microscope, but that were bigger than the tiny organisms that you would see in the microscope would be put at the bottom of the tree. Basically, the bacteria were put at the bottom. The single-celled eukaryotes, the organisms that have a nucleus but are not multicellular be put in the middle in this protistin group. And he tried to draw a pattern of how all of these organisms were related to each other. And people historically have been able to do this pretty well for plants, pretty well for animals and other multicellular organisms. And it's been much harder to do this for microbes or to connect microbes to the rest of the tree. And really, what he did here with protists and with bacteria at the bottom of the tree, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go this far, but it's basically a guess. There wasn't a lot of data behind building this tree. And there were subsequent attempts to make this a little more refined. You may have heard of the Five Kingdom classification, which is common in a lot of textbooks and a lot of discussions of evolution. And this came from someone named Whitaker. And he had now his three main branches glorified at the top of the tree for plants, animals, and fungi. So now there's a new lineage there, the fungi. 
He had Crotus shoved down near the bottom of the tree, and then the bacteria further down at the bottom. But again, there wasn't a lot of evidence behind where the microbes were put on this tree. And this is actually really important to understand how organisms are related to each other. For example, um, historically, and I, I might mention this later, a huge number of organisms have been classified as fungi based upon their appearance. They look like sort of um, fungal hyphae growing in some type of environment. And many of these organisms um, cause various diseases, like the sudden oak gap is caused by one of these organisms that looks like a fungi. It turns out it's not even remotely closely related to fungi. And if you figure out the reclassification, it's really important, for example, for dissolving drugs that will kill that organism, antifungal drugs, don't work on it because it's not a fungus. So, um, and that's true for a lot of classification. This classification is not just an esoteric exercise in understanding history. It's really important for understanding the biology of these organisms. And for microbes, they were generally sort of kept at the bottom, down here, you know, something you stepped on on your big shoe and ignored for really detailed phylogenetic studies until um, the 1970s. And again, there's this incredible diversity. Understanding that diversity, one component of it is understanding how organisms are related to each other. And that really changed with the use of looking at DNA sequence data in the 1970s. And the reason that this was really important was we can compare all the organisms on the planet to each other. So we can compare all the vertebrates to each other by their bone structure. And you can look at sort of where the femur is in different vertebrates, what its shape is, and use that to classify different organisms. Primate femurs are all more similar to each other than they are to you know, femurs from rodents, for example. And you can go through and use these structural features to build a tree of vertebrates. If you want to then build a tree that goes further back in time, you need to look at features that are shared across all the organisms that you're looking at. So if you want to do all animals, you start to have to add in other aspects like developmental processes, looking at the formation of the early embryo that helps you understand the classification of animals. Connecting animals to plants from appearance is pretty hard. What are you going to use that you can compare plants and animals to each other? Connecting plants and animals to bacteria is even harder. And basically what most people started to do in the 1960s and 70s was to look inside the cells of all these organisms and say, well, all of life shares many features in common, in fact, inside of, of our cells. For example, the mechanism by which organisms take DNA and convert it into RNA, transcription of DNA, is highly conserved across all of life. The mechanism by which organisms take RNA, the message, and convert it into protein, that's called translation, that's even more highly conserved across all of life. There's a machine that all organisms on the planet use, called the ribosome, that translates RNA using the genetic code into protein. And it turns out that that machine is so similar across even bacteria, humans, plants, fungi, etc., that we can line up parts of that machine in the same way you would line up the bones between different organisms. And in the 1970s, one person in particular, this person Carl Woese, realized that you could compare the fine details of this machine, just like you would compare the fine details of the femur. You would read the actual string of letters of the DNA sequence that coded for the ribosome in all of these organisms, and could compare even organisms as distantly related as E. coli and humans to each other, and understand how they were related to each other. And he built really the first tree of life that was based upon data, as opposed to based upon, a lot of it was conjecture. And what was incredibly surprising about what he did was he found that there were three main branches in the tree of life. Of all organisms on the planet, if you compare them to each other, there were three main lineages. The eukaryotes, that is the organisms like us, where the DNA is packaged inside a nucleus, so that's plants, animals, fungi, lots of other organisms on the planet. The bacteria, 
the, the single cell organisms that many people were familiar with that have no nucleus to package their DNA. And this included E. coli, Bacillus subtilis, the causative agents of cholera, tuberculosis, and anthrax, Legionnaire's disease, and most of the microbial pathogens that are out there. And then there was this third group, which no one had known anything about prior to doing this, that are now called the archaea. They're a third branch in the tree of life. And that, you know, the detail about the archaea and these three branches is not particularly important. Um, but what's really important is that this allowed people to objectively start to classify organisms and place them into a tree of relatedness. And just like the story I told you about fungi, with these Phytophthora that's not actually a fungus, and you want to know what it is in order to develop treatments for it, there have been thousands of reclassifications of microorganisms based upon this ribosomal comparison to build the tree of life, leading to all sorts of new treatments. I mean, previously, um, bacteria that are, cause Q fever and Rocky Mountain spotted fever during a group called the Rickettsias were grouped together with the organisms that cause chlamydia. Turns out they're not even remotely closely related, probably separated by over a billion years of evolution. And the treatments for Q fever really should be different than the treatments for chlamydial infections. And the same is true for thousands, literally thousands of cases of microbes out there that the old classification that was based upon appearance was completely screwed up. And so this DNA, looking into the inside of these cells, revolutionized our understanding of microbes on the planet. I mean, it revolutionized understanding of other things too, but microbes we knew nothing, basically, before this came along. Um, just one, uh, one aside here, if you look at this tree, you don't have to worry about the details of the tree, and you ask, where are the multicellular organisms on the tree? Those are the ones that are not shaped. Almost all of the diversity of life spends its time as a single cell organism microbe. Very little of the diversity of life is actually what we had understood before this type of work came along. So, this, so, so there was a lot of developments after this. I started working on this, this with things related to this in the late 1980s when I was an undergraduate. Um, I heard about the Tree of Life in New York Times articles, I think when I was in high school, maybe that's why I wrote that uh, dorky essay. Um, and um, got really excited about this, in particular when I was an undergraduate, when I heard about something I'll tell you about in a minute, which relates to using the tree of life to study other organisms. But I just thought I'd give you a, a, a tiny bit of other information. So I spent a lot of my time in the lab working on what you could consider the next phase after what Carl Wolf did, which is rather than just reading information about, so inside every organism we have a genome. That genome is a string of DNA letters, A, C, T, and G. In humans, there are three billion of them. In most bacteria, there's something like two to five million of them. And in the mid-1990s, um, an organization called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research, and someone named Craig Vanther and Hamilton Smith announced that they had read the entire string of letters that determined the genome of one particular organism, a microorganism called Haemophilus influenza. This was the first complete genome sequence of any free living organism on the planet. And this launched basically what you could consider the genomics revolution. I was a graduate student at the time. I was studying um, a variety of extremophiles, organisms that lived in particular at very high salt concentrations or were very resistant to radiation. And I was painstakingly trying to extract DNA out of these organisms and read that string of letters behind a single gene in these organisms. So that basically made up about one, one thousandth of the genome of these organisms. And I went to a talk by this guy Hamilton Smith, and he had a list of the genomes that this institute, Tiger, was sequencing. And it was every organism that I was working on. So here I was spending years trying to read a single gene and they announced that with new methods and use of automated reading of DNA sequence data and computer bioinformatic analysis of the DNA data, they were reading the whole genome of these organisms. I cried a little bit. Um, it, was, it was not a good thing. Um, and then um, I realized if you can't beat them, uh, join them. And 
And eventually, after graduate school, I got a faculty job at the Institute for Genomic Research, and I spent eight years there sequencing genomes of different microorganisms. Incredibly exciting thing. We, you know, I participated in the first plant genome sequencing project. The project sequenced the malaria genome. The project sequenced the cholera genome. Um, it was very, very exciting, very, very cool. We could learn all sorts of interesting things about not just the evolution of the organisms, but their actual biology. By reading their instructions book, it turns out it's, you know, half the time it seems like hieroglyphics and half the time it might seem like maybe Cantonese or something like that. But we could get a little bit of information out of that. You can do things like predict, and this actually works pretty well, the entire suite of biochemical functions present in an organism. And every process by which that organism moves um, molecules in and out of the cell. Now, you know, maybe 50% of these were correct, but that's pretty darn good compared to what we knew. Some of the organisms we sequenced the genome of, like Dinococcus radiodurans, the most radiation resistant organism known. We probably knew the functions of eight genes in that organism before sequencing the genome. And after sequencing the genome, we had predictions of the function of 5,000 genes. Now, it wasn't perfect, but it revolutionized microbiology to be able to do this. You could do things as you might have heard in the press now, but we started doing it, so we, were work we worked on the anthrax letters. This is, you know, probably before some of the people here are bored and I'm going to cry. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, in um, just after the September 11th attacks, there were letters sent to the White House and to the Senate building and to a couple of press offices that contained spores of the pathogen Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax. We were sequencing the genome of anthrax at the time, and so we were the place that the FBI and other agencies came and said, can you help us understand how the anthrax in these letters is related to the anthrax in the bench of some scientist somewhere where the anthrax that other people were working on. And just like Carl Woese could build a tree of life based upon analysis of the ribosome, we could build a tree of anthrax based upon analysis of the genome of anthrax. And there's now a huge field called genomic epidemiology, where people, every time there's an outbreak of a new disease like the flu or the E. coli in Germany, people are now sequencing the genome of those organisms to try and understand how they're related to something else. So that's been very exciting. I don't want to take away from that. Uh, I live and breathe this. But the most exciting part of DNA analysis for microbes is really what you could call CSI microbiology. And that's what is called looking at DNA in the environment. And the reason that this is important is I haven't, I've been sort of misleading you. Everything I've been talking about so far involves organisms that we can grow in the laboratory. So this is important for microbes because when you go to an environment and you look in the environment, appearance is not a good indicator of what those organisms are. And if we want to get, if we want to study the biochemistry of an organism, we need lots and lots and lots of copies of their cells. And the way we do that is we grow the organism back in the laboratory. That's called culturing. And you grow it in isolation from other organisms so you get a pure sample of the organism that you're interested in. And you can do cell biology, genetics, molecular biology, biochemistry, physiology, evolution, etc., of those organisms that you grow in the laboratory. And this culturing of microbes has been fundamentally important to studying them. It's what allowed Woes to look at their ribosomes. It's what allowed Craig Venter and Hamilton Smith and then me and others to look at their genomes. And it's that, you know, that's critically important. Unfortunately, it's not enough. And what I'm going to tell you sort of just a, a little story here, which is if you go to an environment, like a Yellowstone hot spring, this is an overhead picture of one of the hot springs in Yellowstone that we did a little work of organisms from, and you split the sample in two, and you take half the sample and you try and grow the organisms from half that half of the sample in the lab by culture. And you take the other half of the sample and you just look in the microscope, and you ask, how many cells are there in that sample? Or what do they look like in that sample? And you count now how many you can grow versus how many you see. Sadly, in almost every environment people look at, 99% of the things in that environment you can see but can't grow. So we're learning about all the organisms by culturing, and we're only culturing less than 1% of the organisms from any one environment. So we are missing a huge fraction of the diversity of microbial life via culturing because we can't grow them in the lab. 
And so this has been a conundrum. It's called the great plate count anomaly because you're counting organisms by growing them on plates. So culturing is cool and great, and we do it all the time, but it's not enough for learning about the biology of microbes. And so what do you do? What is the solution to this? One of the big solutions that came out originally in the 1980s and has continued to expand has been to say, OK, if Carl Wose can read the ribosomes of organisms grown in the lab, or Craig Venter can read the genome of an organism grown in the lab, why can't we just go directly to the environment, extract DNA, and read information about the ribosomes directly from the environment, or information about the genome directly from the environment? And so that, that's what people have been doing, basically, for the last you know, 15, 20 years for studies of microbes without ever having to grow them in the laboratory. You can look at their DNA. And in the last five years, this has become much easier and cheaper because of advancements in computer technology and in technology to read DNA sequence data. So when I was an undergraduate, I heard about the first attempts to go read DNA sequence data from environmental samples. And I joined a lab that was working on this, on studying organisms from the bottom of the ocean that no one could work on in the lab. And I was incredibly excited about this. I actually worked as a senior and then for a year after graduating in this lab. And in two years, I read the DNA sequence of a single gene that was 1,500 base pairs in length. And that project probably cost $30,000 or something to that effect. In our lab today, for $1,000, we can read in two days the sequence of 40 million genes for $1,000 in two days. The DNA sequencing technology has gone insane. And it has revolutionized. You hear about the Human Genome Project, personal genomics, cancer genomics, other type of genotyping and DNA-based characterization of organisms like us that have 3 billion letters in our DNA code. Well, microorganisms have much smaller genetic codes. We can read their genetic code for even less. Right now, it costs about $100 to read the complete genome sequence of a microorganism. And Craig Venter, when they sequenced the homophilus influenza genome in 1995, that was something like a $6 million project. So again, this has become sort of standard operating procedure now. And now, someone interested in something kind of insane, a field guide to the microbes. I mean, there are billions of microbes in a drop of water. How are we going to make this field guide? We can use DNA sequencing now to characterize lots of environmental and that's what people are doing, is going out into the environment, collecting samples, extracting DNA from those samples, and then reading the DNA sequence of them and trying to learn about the organisms that are in those samples. Whether they're organisms in the bottom of the ocean, like the ones I worked on as an undergraduate, we spent a bunch of time studying the microorganisms that live inside the gut of this insect. Um, it's the glassy wing sharpshooter. It's a nasty little thing, which is a vector for Pierce's disease in grapes. Um, if you see this on the side of the road, um, call the USDA, seriously. Um, and we used it to learn about the microbes that live in the gut of this insect that help it survive on its weird diet of just fluids from inside the plants that it feeds on. When people have gone into environmental samples, they found not only are there hundreds of kinds of, of, of microbes that you can't grow, there are whole lineages of microbes. So most of the different kinds of organisms we've never grown in the laboratory. We are only learning about them by this DNA analysis. It would be like going to an island and being told you can only learn about the ants. I mean, what? yes, it would be cool to learn about some things, so we've been studying the organisms that we can learn about. But most of what we've been doing by culturing has been a tiny fraction of the diversity of life that's out there. And this now allows me and others to go out and actually do biogeography of microbes. So just like we have a map of where the American robin is supposed to be, people are now starting to build a map of where different bacteria are supposed to be, where different fungi are supposed to be, and how they might change with change in agricultural practices or climate change and so on by this DNA analysis. I thought I would just mention that um, this DNA analysis, as many of you might be familiar with, has become so cheap that now there are projects to engage the public and citizens in some of these DNA-based studies. We're doing this 
with microorganisms. I'd love to talk to some of the teachers here about that. Um, we're doing a project, for example, to sample the microbes on the space station. Um, and we have a bunch of people going around to various events, growing up microorganisms from those events, and some of those are going to get sent to the space station for a NCAA tournament style competition of the microbes from different environments. Um, um, but there's lots of opportunity now to do what people have been doing for 20 or 30 years with birds or frogs or butterflies, engaging the public in the study of those organisms to do that with microbes. There's even places where if you want to type the microbes that live in your kitchen or on your skin, you can now send off samples just like people are doing DNA typing with companies like 23andMe and other places you can now do this with microorganisms. And the last thing I sort of want to talk about is the revolution that I think people are most excited about is the microbes that live in and on people or in and on plants and animals that we care about. These are called the microbiome, the microbial biome of a community. And so for people, I, I love this. This is a, a figure from a paper by a colleague of mine in a high profile journal. And for some reason, they felt the need to make it anatomically correct. And so I have censored um, the figure that they use. But what people are now doing is treating the human landscape just like we would treat the landscape of Earth. And going in and sampling the different parts of one person and the different parts of many people and looking at what microbes live on your skin, what microbes live in your mouth, what microbes live in your gut, what microbes live on different parts of you. How do those microbes differ between people that have different health statuses. So people have now found, for example, that people with various um, autoimmune diseases have very different microbial compositions than so-called healthy people. Now, we don't know if that is a result of the autoimmune condition or a cause of the autoimmune condition, but in the last few years, there have been many studies in mice and a couple in humans that have shown that the collection of microbes that live in and on people or in and on these animals can in fact cause interesting phenotypes like obesity. There's this great experiment in mice where Jeff Gordon and his colleagues took a particular genetic line of mice that gets obese. It's got a mutation in the gene that was um, called the OB gene. Um, so the mouse is called OB, OB, because it has mutations in both versions of its OB gene. These mice get really fat. They went and took the microbes out of those mice transplanted them into genetically normal skinny mice, and they got fat. So the microbes can transmit the obesity from one mouse to another mouse. And there are suggestions that this might be happening in humans too. There's a lot of evidence or suggestion that microbes are involved in the development of our immune system, in protecting us from pathogens, in development of certain behavioral patterns, in our smell, in all sorts of other aspects of our biology. And this is largely coming about via the application of these DNA sampling technologies to treating the human body as an ecosystem, as opposed to what we were doing before, which was largely looking just at the microbes that killed us or made us sick. And now what we're doing is looking at us like what we are, which is an ecosystem. There are probably 50,000 species of microbes living on each and every one of us, if not more. And most of those don't hurt us. Most of them probably don't help us either. But that diversity is unsampled, basically, and poorly understood. So I think um, my dream is actually amazingly starting to happen. We are actually able to start to think about building a field guide to the microbes, such that if, just like with the robin showing up in London, you go into your doctor, or you bring your cat or dog into the vet, or you take your plant into the ag extension station, and they can say, oh, this is weird, that microbe is not supposed to be on your foot. Um, or that microbe is an indication that, you know, have you been traveling to Namibia recently? Um, and we are going to start to understand the dynamic landscape that is not just ourselves, but basically every ecosystem on the planet. And it's certainly daunting. There are a lot of microbes out there. But by thinking about it like with the field guide to birds, nobody building a field guide to birds worries about getting the map perfect. I mean, if you go out to the Yola Basin, again, where I spend a lot of time birding, 
there are probably, during the winter, a million snow peaks there. No one's counting them all. That doesn't really matter. But knowing that snow peaks are there, as opposed to in New York City, is informative. And that's what we're going to basically do with microbes. And so I will stop there. And then Happy to answer questions, or you know, maybe you don't want to touch people because the microbes or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the question is, why are you not able to grow some of these organisms? Um, there are a lot of theories about this. There actually are some papers now showing why in some cases. I'll start with the theories. So some of the theories are you know, very simple. We don't know what they need. We don't know what to feed them. So that you know, we haven't figured out for some of them just what the conditions are. And if you start to diversify the different types of food or environmental conditions that you apply, you are able to grow a lot more. So if you put organisms that you, know, you give them no oxygen, anaerobic organisms, Suddenly, you're able to grow a lot more. Or if you give them certain types of growth conditions, you're able to grow more. Another theory is that they have interactions with other organisms that we are not able to recreate. And so, this concept of growing them in isolation from everything else is actually kind of a faulty concept because they have dynamic interactions with other organisms and we may never be able to recreate them. But it turns out people have actually started to figure this out. A lot of it is based upon genome data. So, you can read the entire genome sequence organism without really growing it. And then people have looked at that data and said, oh, that's really surprising. This organism is missing vitamin B12 synthesis, and we weren't putting that in. Or this organism is you know, missing an entire pathway, and we weren't putting that there. And people have figured out for some of them how to now grow them. And there's a whole other group of something that people may not have thought about, which is that most of the way you grow them in the lab is to grow them in really dense concentrations. Turns out that a lot of organisms out there are more like leopards than they are like zebras. And they don't really like to grow in massively concentrated concentrations of trillions of them in one tiny solution. So, for example, there's a guy in Oregon, Steve Giovanoni, who's figured out for a lot of ocean adapted microbes that if you grow them in giant, you know, 50 liter vats in very low concentrations, they're perfectly happy. You just need big vats and low concentrations. So, I mean, there's a lot of work on this that people are starting to figure out in some cases. You know, the DNA analysis is imperfect. Growing them in the lab is really important for understanding their biology. So we, we really need to do this for our There was one in the, in the back. Yeah, 
going to cover it. So that sort of Two minutes to just get ourselves prepared and then we're going to launch into a long series of awards. 